What's up, everyone? It's me, Drew, your host of the Fit to Fat to Fit Experience podcast. Thank you for taking some time, some time out of your busy day to tune in to another episode on this podcast. Today, I have a good friend of mine. Her name is Maria Kang. You might remember her as the no excuse mom from way back in the day. She went viral for posting a picture of her with her three boys, and she's super fit and has like a, a sign on her stomach that says no excuses, and she went viral. Uh, and got known as the no excuse mom. Well, I've gotten to know her really well over the past six months. We've become really good friends, really close, and we kind of dive into her journey. And she's been through so much. Uh, she recently went through a divorce, got diagnosed with cancer, broken arm, and did ayahuasca all like, you know, pretty much within the past year. <laughs> and so we dive into her healing journey. Uh, we talk about her family environment growing up. Um, in Sacramento with her parents um, and, you know, her a family of like, I think three sisters. And, you know, we she dies into <clears throat> how she's been broken in many ways and how it's transformed her. And uh, she's evolved into the, the version of who she is today. And if you don't follow her on social media, you definitely should. It's Maria Kang, K-A-N-G. <clears throat> you can look her up on, on Facebook and uh, Instagram. She's been a blogger for I think over definitely over a decade now um she's been blogging forever and so we dive deep into her story i think her story is very powerful and can help a lot of you out there that might be you know uh blindsided by <laughs> the curveballs that life throws at you so um i'm really excited to share her story with you guys before we jump in really quick announcement <clears throat> this summer of 2024 i will be doing my first ever conscious fitness retreat here on the big island of hawaii here in kailua kona we're going to be Having an Airbnb uh, of uh, where we'll have 12 to 15 people max, so it's going to be a very small, intimate group. Uh, the rooms are already filling up pretty fast. It is first come, first serve. And if you are interested, um, I will post a link in the show notes to go uh, apply for that. It's at consciousfitnesscoaching.com forward slash retreat dash 2024. Um, I'll put a link in the show notes, though, so you can just click on it. Um, and if you, if you just go to consciousfitnesscoaching.com and scroll down to the very bottom, you will see the retreat information and the application right there. And once you schedule, once you apply, I will schedule a zoom call with you, just, uh, with me and you, uh, face to face to go over the details of the retreat and see if it's a good fit. Um, so if any of you are interested in coming out here to do a conscious fitness retreat, where we will, um, help you become the best version of you physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, we will be doing things like daily breathwork sessions, cold plunge, sauna, meditation, workouts on the beach. We'll be doing some amazing hikes. I will show you guys the beauty of this island. We'll be swimming with manta rays at, at nighttime. Uh, Luau will be learning more about the Hawaiian culture, and it'll be an awesome bonding experience for you and, and like-minded strangers from all over the world that are coming to do this retreat. I can't wait to share the experience with you guys. So like I said, um, the link will be in the show notes. It's at consciousfitnesscoaching.com. Scroll down to click on the retreat and it'll take you right there uh, to, to the application. So um, I would love to meet some of you in person. Finally, I've been meaning to do this for years and I finally pulled the trigger on it. It's finally happening. We're moving forward and I hope to see some of you guys there. So go check that out. And uh, without any further ado, let's go listen and hang out with Maria Kang. Maria, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Good to have you on finally. Um, I remember when I reached out to you like was <laughs> three years ago and try to get you on and then totally drop the ball on you. You and constantly <laughs> drop the ball on me. <laughs> I'm Touché. just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> no, that's fair. I was going to have you on years ago and I don't know what was going on in my life. Probably some hard things, I'm assuming. I, maybe, it was, maybe it was before I left for Hawaii. So it might have been in Utah. So it could have been like three, four years ago. Mm-hmm. But anyways, here we are today, finally on the podcast. Um, super excited to have you on. Um, just because I've had the privilege of getting to know you on a deeper level the past six months. And I'm really, really excited to talk to you because I feel like now that I know you better, we can go a little bit deeper, which I think I know my audience and your audience mm -hmm. will probably appreciate because there's a lot of things that you, you've done a lot of growing the past few years. And totally. I want to, I want to start from the beginning though. So maybe talk a little bit about your, your family history. How did you, how did you guys, where, first of all, where are your ancestors from and how did you guys end up in Sacramento of all places? I love that question. No one has asked me that question. <laughs> awesome. My ancestors are from, uh, my father's Chinese 
and my mother is um, Filipina, but they met in New Zealand because my mm -hmm. dad was born in Malaysia and there's better opportunities for Christians and Chinese people abroad. So he went to New Zealand and my mother was born in DC because my grandfather was a Filipino diplomat. So he, oh. she was born American and she went to New Zealand because that's where he was stationed at the time. And that's how they met at a Christian fellowship. Wow, I didn't know that. No, I didn't yeah. know that was part then, of your family history. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then we ended up in Sacramento. Because, well, I was born in San Francisco, but after the earthquake in 89 and just how, the, just yeah. the prices in San Francisco wasn't very, um, it wasn't friendly to like families, right? So we came over to the Valley and it's been awesome since. Yeah. And your parents are were very hard workers. What did they do for work? They were extremely hardworking. So um, I often retell the story that my parents began um, with very, very little. Like we were on welfare for a brief period. I grew up in the, the very, I want to say, quote unquote, ghetto part of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So uh, my mother, you know, she started just managing a garage, you know, when she was in San Francisco. And then my dad did a bunch of different things, but ended up retiring as a sergeant for the um, San Francisco Police Department. So, wow. yeah. Yeah, very hard workers. Uh, three daughters. There's three girls, right, in the family? Yes. Three Maybe girls. Maybe Tom. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. And you're the oldest? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're the oldest. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm the oldest. <laughs> Maybe talk about your family environment and how that shaped you. And maybe now that you've done a lot of work on yourself, maybe connecting the dots of how that kind of affected you throughout your years as you've grown. I think that um, what we don't recognize is, you know, with, especially in terms of environment growing up, we always think of like the city, the school, but definitely my, my pecking order played a big role in my development because there's one boy and three girls and I'm the eldest girl and we're all one year apart, just like my sons. And so um, it definitely made me very responsible at a young age. In fact, I was telling someone today that I grew up really fast because my mother was a young, young mother. She had like four mm. kids before she was 22 and super wow. ambitious. And um, but yeah, she was very busy. And so and my dad worked a lot. So I really just started mm. taking ownership over the operations of the household and just trying to make I became a people pleaser very early, basically. <laughs> That's why we're such good friends, because I can relate. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's kind of a survival mechanism of becoming a people pleaser, because if you didn't do what you were told, there was probably consequences. Am I right? Well, if I feel like in, um, if I, I always did what I was told, you know, I was such a, a good girl. Wow. Um, but if they didn't do what they were told, I would be the one still responsible for it all. <laughs> so that was just, Cause that was older. my life because I was, um, because who else is going to do it? But me, yeah. like that was really my attitude. Like no one's going to do this. No one's going to, you know, but I've changed that since. So, so because of that environment, did it cause you, and we don't need to get into specifics, but it, did it cause you to hide certain things from your parents because you didn't feel safe showing certain sides of you or parts of you? Because if you found out there would be, they, they'd be disappointed or there'd be a consequence. Did that happen to you at all? Or no, were you just like, perfect? <laughs> so that's, I love it. <laughs> Actually, my mom used to say, Maria, you're so close to perfect, but you're not because no one is. Because I truly was, yeah. you know, I woke her up every morning at 4.50 a.m. and made her breakfast, ironed her clothes, like cleaned the what? house, like took the dogs out. Like, and I started that at like 11 years old. Okay. So I was a, my girls need to step up their game. Here yeah. <laughs> that's why when you that. tell me about them, I'm like, hmm, I would, my son's definitely... I, I, there's operations here too, but, um, anyways, uh, no, it was just, I think for myself going, I forgot the question, but I, I wasn't in trouble because I always was so good and I never okay. really hit anything because I was, you know, I'm very outspoken. Yeah. I was outspoken as a child too. Okay. And I, I started speaking like an adult at a very young age too, in okay. terms of directing or telling them what I think about things or, you know wanting them to take my advice about how to run their household. It was just so funny. But yeah. I will say that um, that it, it, I, I don't know. I, I definitely have a rebellious spirit. I definitely okay. question authority because of it. Um, 
And I don't regret the experience because it made me who I am. But at the same time, as I have grown a lot, I'm realizing I just need to just be quiet sometimes. So. <laughs> you don't need yeah. to be so outspoken. No. Um, so you didn't have like a rebellious phase. Like once you left for college, you were like, oh, finally, I can live my life. I can do what I want to do. You didn't have that type of like freedom type of phase. No, because I was always kind of free. My parents were really not there. <laughs> so it's not gotcha, like they yeah. stopped us from doing anything. We had to really self-regulate, self-discipline ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that's really, you know, what helped my character. Um, but I do know, honestly, and this is getting deep. Mm -hmm. um, if there's anything I've ever done that was super rebellious was marrying my ex-husband. Because <laughs> really? I definitely think that I know what they want, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do this instead. <laughs> Ooh, so yeah. It wasn't what they wanted. I know. I'll, I'll, you know, he, well, he was, he's a great man, but it yeah. was very challenging from the very mm -hmm. beginning. A lot of red okay. flags, but, um, and he, but again, it's not that he's not a great man, um, but it's not usually what you're, you want for your daughter. You know, yeah, he's married okay. prior. He has, you know, three other children. You know what I mean? Like there's... Yeah. Normally, I'm sure that's not what you want for your, you know, for your sure. daughter. So. Yeah. No, I, and I can see that, and I I can relate in a lot of ways because I think the way I was raised was a very similar way to the way you were raised, which is why we get along so well. Because mm -hmm. I, I understand those patterns of how they affected me, and I think, you know, the discipline, the um, being like, uh, responsible from a very young age, like fitting in line and not rocking the boat and doing what you're told and obedience and mm -hmm. all those things. And I see now the positives of that. Mm -hmm. And I see the negatives meaning like, okay, that's why I struggled with self-love. Mm -hmm. Did you struggle with loving yourself? Looking oh, back? Totally. I mean, I still struggle with loving myself, yeah. you know, which is interesting because <laughs> I really am not short of like really loving like the essence of myself, but I think yeah. that um, I think that there's quality. Like you have to ask yourself also, you know, am I truly happy with my life right now? You know, like happy with everything that in that's going on. And yes, there's a lot of things that I'm really happy about, but there's things that I would love to shift, love to change and evolve. And those are the parts of myself that. Um, that I know the parts of myself in the past that led me to that moment or, or to endure that challenge that I'm going through right now. Like I need to really kind of like forgive myself and let go of mm. things that I'm not quite happy with currently, you know, like, and it's always a constant thing because you're never perfectly happy. Right. There's always a challenge. Sure. Yeah. Do you feel like you struggled or maybe you're working through this, but like being hard on yourself? Because you had to be hard on yourself to like do the things you're supposed to do, do you still find yourself being hard on yourself? Yes, I am. And it, I would give you an example. So sure. we're supposed to record today, and I'm like running late because I'm going through. I'm doing. I'm, I have a really busy day, and yeah, I was gonna going to be through a lot um, right now. Yeah. And so like, I was going to be late picking up my son. I felt really bad and I could have asked my girlfriend to pick him up, but then I felt like I haven't picked him up all week because I've yep. always, I've been running late. And so there's just this constant mom guilt, this critic, you know, and, um, actually I was meditating. I do a lot of meditation earlier today I love it. and I was hearing myself. I was remembering when I was a child and just like thinking of my parents and thinking you're doing it wrong. Like in my head, like they're parenting wrong. They're doing it wrong. And then I hear that voice and I hear that voice reflected back myself and how I even, you know, my past relationships or just friendships or just my, especially myself where I'm hearing you're doing it wrong, you know, or you're, you're not quite, yeah. you, you could be doing it better. So yeah. there's definitely just that critic alone is a, a, a sign of lack of self-love. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's where we're very similar, where that will always be a part of us, most likely. And it served a purpose for a period of time. It definitely maybe helped us achieve some really hard things in this life. And also it comes at the cost of maybe when we are good enough, we're still not, there. we're never quite there. And like I said, it's a good thing, it's a bad thing. I think now as we get older, we get wiser, it's like, okay, what do we want for our kids? Like, mm -hmm. you know, and we get to pick and choose because we have tools like meditation which i don't know if your parents were into that or my, my parents definitely weren't <laughs> or like therapy or 
you know, breath work. Our parents weren't into those things. That wasn't like even around or wasn't even like a thing for people back then. They just kind of like deal with it. Right. And Mm -hmm. we're becoming more aware uh, and and allowing, allowing ourselves to feel our feelings, which is also hard because it's counterintuitive to the inner critic of like, well, this is how I've always done things. Mm -hmm. So I'm really interested in diving deep into your journey of growth. So maybe let's start with, um, your marriage, you said that was kind of, you know, a little bit <laughs> like maybe talk about that uh, publicly, if that's OK. Like how like how long were you guys married? He is a mixed a blended family. You guys had three kids together. Your kids are amazing. By the way, your three sons are like rock stars. So talk about that journey and then divorce and, and how that affected you. Well, um, David and I met in late 2000 seven, maybe, I don't know, but it was a really fast courtship. I mean, I fell really fast in, I don't know if it's love, but I just really felt like at that moment, as I reflect now that I'm divorced, um, I just knew that I wanted to have kids like now, (laughs) like I wanted, I wanted to have a family and, um, and I just wanted to follow this path, you know, cause that's what especially society tells you this is next, you know? And so um, he was down, you know, he was really committed and I loved that about him. And that's actually one of the best qualities he has is he has so much confidence and he just, yeah, it was, it's very easy to fall in love with his words and his eyes. He's a very handsome guy. So we were um, together, together, maybe a total of 15 years, um, married for 12, officially 13 years, but, um, it was a hard marriage. It wasn't easy. You know, um, there's obviously it's a blended family. He had a very tumultuous divorce that, Mm. you know, honestly, towards the end of our marriage, I felt like because there was so much constant negative communication that I felt like he was still married (laughs) to (laughs) his first wife, because that's a strong, you know, um, whether it's love or hate, it's the same type of intensity. And so it's just, it, whatever it was, it wasn't serving our current family. So I, I know that had a lot to do with my, um, my struggles. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And what would you say you learned from it? What did you learn the, from marriage? The marriage? Yeah. Um, Life let's lessons. See. I mean, there's, that's a big question. You it just don't say, question. so what did you learn from that? Like a 15 year relationship? <laughs> You're so what annoying. What are some you. things that pop up off the top of your head? Like, oh, this is how I, I mean, grew. okay. There's so much. First off, like I've learned so much. I learned number one, to love myself. That's always mm-hmm. number one, right? Okay. And to forgive yourself and where you were, you know, at the time yeah. I, it took me years to divorce you know, because, um, I was really trapped in, I was very, very Catholic growing up and, um, it really, the, the religious aspect of sinning and just like, you made this promise for the rest of your life. And I just felt so guilty because of that. And I know that that really played a role in me deciding to get married too, because even though, um, sure I can have these, I had two children with him with before we got married. Um, I, we could definitely raise these kids single, you know, yeah. but at the same time, I just had this ideal, like I was such an ideal, I still am. I'm a dreamer. I'm, I'm so ideal. Yeah. Right. And so anyways, um, I really learned that it's not, it wasn't just religious, but it was society. And it, the biggest thing was my ego. Cause everyone who knows me knows that like, I don't give up. Like someone told me that, and she saw my marriage kind of like, being very challenged for so many years. And she said, Marie, you're like a dog with a bone. Like you would not give up. And I, I, everyone knows I tried my hardest, but what I learned is that I just really need to let this ego die. Cause it's not, you know, serving mm. me here either. So yeah, yeah I just, it's a lot of self-love to just understand um, your heart. I always yeah. say if there's a, you know, if there's a hard path or an easy path, choose hard. And what was hard was, um, was uh staying with him like years ago when i filed separation like Mm -hmm. 2016 and so um so i decided i'm gonna go hard which is stay with him and then when we finally kind of like divorced in 2023 yeah i i realized the hard was like going this path now 
And so I chose that path. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's a that's a good um, mindset to have. Choose the harder path, <laughs> and that's good that you you've um, you know been able to do that like most of your life. Where would you say? Because you grew up Catholic, and I and I can totally empathize. Me growing up Mormon, mm-hmm. the shame of like and the the, the quote unquote failure perspective of like divorcing and, and ending your marriage. I totally get that, and that's really hard. That's a, that's a hard one um, because we're so programmed to like oh, this is bad. I shouldn't do this. But if I don't, like, you're kind of like, what do I do? And Mm -hmm. so I I can relate to that in a lot of ways. So thank you for sharing that. And I know it's not easy. Um, And you're kind of still fresh out of it. Like you said, you got divorced in 2023. Mm -hmm. Uh, So like, yeah, that that is very new in a sense, even though you've been separated, like I think longer, but um, maybe talk a little bit about how you maybe like your spiritual journey, if you will like how it's evolved over the years, like you you do teach breathwork now, like where did your spiritual journey begin and how? My spiritual journey started really, really young. Like okay. I was very, um, I was very deep at a young age. You know, I, I mm. started writing poetry, you know, I got published for the first time when I was like 10. Wow. Um, really? But I remember crying a lot when I was a child. And I just remember just my first awakening when I was mm. turned, I think I turned four. I used to cry because I loved my mom and I didn't want to ever leave her. And one day the teacher said, Maria, are you going to cry today? And I said, no, I'm going to cry. I'm four years old. Like, you know, but anyways, like I would think a lot, like I would look at all my, like, like all my stuffed animals and wonder, do, do these animals, like these like stuffed animals, are they alive? Do they have energy? Like I was very like questionable about everything. And I would look and people driving and I was probably like eight and I would see, um, all of these people, these humans. And I'm like, they're, if I'm alive, they're alive and everyone's alive. And like, what's the purpose of living? Like, these are the questions I had when I was like eight years old. So yeah. my spiritual journey started really early, which is why I really attached to my, my religion growing up because it, it gave me some sense of peace, but also I still had a lot of questions. You know, I was a catechist, which is a, they teach kids to go into the first Holy Communion. Like that's how deep I was. And I visited, I did a pilgrimage to the Holy Land in Israel. I have, wow. I always say that I, I if, if Mother Mary showed up on this earth, I have visited it, you know, like 50% at least the places. Cause I've been to <laughs> Lourdes, I've been to Fatima, I've been to Medjugorje. And these are all places that wow. she showed up to young children because I'm obsessed with, you know, obsessed with the truth like I want to I want to feel it I want to know the energy and so in the last yeah. several years it's changed a lot it's shifted a yeah. lot because um I started with a uh a mushroom trip <laughs> okay. talk about that yeah <laughs> talk about that. <laughs> okay but I did it because <laughs> so I did it be I mean I was interested because I actually have seen Paul Stamet speak in person oh, cool. um and I understand the um the benefits of psychedelics I'm not a very, um, I am very conservative in a lot of things, but I'm so open. And so um, David was really interested in, in you know, going through a journey. And so I surprised him on his birthday. I said, hey, I got this for you, you know. And so we both went on this retreat. I didn't know what was going to happen. I thought that, um, I thought I was here for him (laughs) to support him. And then ends up. I've got a lot of trauma. I had no idea. <laughs> and yeah. so so it started there. It started with that. And then I started going to like meditation retreats with Joe Dispenza and then mm. you know, eventually doing other things um, mm. like Bufo in Austin. And I've also tried obviously ayahuasca in Costa Rica. So I just, I've just been going through this mm. awakening of like remembering just the essence of my spirit of who I am, like prior yeah. to coming into this, to this world. How does that change your view of your of your religion growing up? Did, has it changed it? Has it evolved it? Like, well, how would you say it's affected that perspective of what you grew up with versus these things, which probably most people in that religion are like, uh, I don't know if that's actually okay or part of the religion. Like, how does it, sure. how does it change or evolve your, your views on that? I think that uh, a lot of people, a lot of my followers have like DM me and said, are you still Catholic? <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, technically I'm sure. excommunicated being divorced to be oh. honest. You know what I mean? I, you get excommunicated I, if you get divorced? Well, in the past you, you, you were, and in oh. fact, you have to get an annulment in order to get married again. And that's the rules. I mean, the, oh, one wow. of the reasons why uh, Dave and I took a long time to get married is because he had to get his first marriage annulled, even oh. though he wasn't Catholic at the time. There's a lot of rules. 
Yeah. And what I know for sure, um, um, in my in my own sense of awareness and self, is that there is not as many rules, you know, in the in the there's there's natural laws, but there's just too many freaking rules. I <laughs> like it without like using it. Yeah. You know me personally, so you know I cuss a lot. But yeah. <laughs> you can cuss a lot. I, I, I struggle. I struggle with a lot of things that I just don't think is right. I think that anything created by humans uh, is going to be imperfect because that's yeah. just nature, right? Um, but I've definitely evolved. Um, would, I, would people consider me Catholic? I, you know, I love Jesus. You know, I love... Um, the, the teachings in the Bible, I quote them a lot. Um, but in terms of, uh, do I consider myself Catholic? I mean, I, I do. I mean, I'm still Christian. I still believe, you know, in Jesus and all that stuff. But at the same time, I have a very strong spiritual core that um, could be not compatible. Yeah, I can, I can relate to that in a lot of ways. Thank you for sharing that, by the way. I know it's kind of like a touchy subject for some people, but I, I agree. I think a lot, there are a lot of things that are man-made. And I think as you kind of evolve, you're like, um, this rule doesn't feel good to me, <laughs> like to be excommunicated just because you get divorced. I think that's really interesting. How does all of this fit into your the personality of Maria King, the no excuse mom? I know you probably don't like that label. Like how did, how does this journey of like what you've been going through affect the maria king that the world knows from fitness the fitness world very curious about that are you talking about like the journey of towards divorce or a journey yeah like, like your evolution of like you know divorce spirituality you know psychedelics <laughs> ayahuasca all the things like how does that change your perspective or outlook on just yeah like your your fitness journey so i mean i think that um a lot of people who started following me initially um, really liked my and was resonating with my this is who I am and this is what I'm going to say and you know I know that like standing your ground kind of deal and mm. that has not changed like that energy is um, is truly my brand which is not so much no excuses like there's never an excuse but really did you try your hardest mm. you know did you try everything because if you tried everything then obviously there's no you know there's no excuse you've already, you tried every single thing you know and that's yeah. how it is in my life like i i definitely feel like um with the divorce it really challenged my ego um it it was truly if i felt like a failure and mm. um you know that sucked it sucked yeah. when i you know, I'll tell you of several things. It sucked getting divorced. It sucked getting cancer. You know, it yeah. sucked um, when I. It sucked when my son got into trouble at school. The you know a few days ago, because I feel like. Um, what happened he, a couple of days ago? I didn't. Well, <laughs> I didn't hear the story. I <laughs> know, but I know, but I mean, he just he just gets you know, like he's a boy. I like, have three sons, and they've got lots of testosterone, and some he's of them get angry. But what I'm saying is, is that it just it really sucks to to promote something about like health and not be healthy, or mm. happiness and not you know you know or, or marriage and all of those things and love and, and just self love and realizing, Oh shit, I haven't been loving myself, you know, shit. I haven't been prioritizing this and yeah. Oh shit. I let that go for a while. You know what I mean? So it's constantly a humbling experience when you um, say, this is who I am and realize, Oh, oh shit, that maybe this isn't who I am. Hmm. I can relate to that in a lot of ways, you know, and, and I appreciate you bringing that up. I feel like you're the type of person who, like when hard things happen in life, like you kind of like put this arm, you armor up, you, you put on a lot of armor because you're strong and you, you, you're like, I can do this hard thing. And I think that's, um, that's served, served you. You've been through some really hard things in your life and I've only known you for a short period of time. And I'm like, this girl's going through so, like, I don't think I've met anyone that's going through so much like adversity in such a short period of time. And here you are, like hair done, makeup done, getting kids to school, no sleep pretty much, like putting on an expo, making time for podcasts. Um, it's amazing what you accomplish. And it, it's so I feel like the things that you've learned that you've probably been passed on to you have served a purpose, but they come at the cost of maybe, uh, um, you know, um, 
not allowing yourself to fully love yourself because like that's kind of seen as a weakness or maybe it's seen as like but at the, at the same time what do you feel like all these things are teaching like, the stuff that's been happening now from let's start with your mom dying like let's start from there and then cancer and then breaking your arm and then hard divorce stuff and hard kid stuff how are you you how are you how are you still here and like talk to us about that because i feel like you're a unique human who has the ability to go through those hard things so start with maybe your mom and how that started like how did that affect you and, and like how are you able to like push through that Okay, so I think that um, there's so many lessons that I've learned in the last two and a half years since my mom passed away. And keep in mind, for those watching or listening, my mother is my, you know, my inspiration, but she had a lot of health issues, you know, starting with diabetes in her 20s, strokes in her 30s, heart attacks in her 40s, and a kidney transplant before she turned 50. She passed away at 60. She had a lot of ailments going on. Um, we can't really pinpoint what, you know, ultimately led to her final, you know, passing. But um, what I know for sure, because I was present there at her bedside and it was unexpected, was um, that this woman that I loved to me in my heart, I don't think she was truly living the life she wanted to live mm. her whole life as her observer, as her loving you know, observer as a daughter. And I definitely know that she influenced me to be who I was. I remember writing her a tearful letter when I was like 22, 23, as I was living yeah. in San Francisco and I was independent and I, you know, had graduated with two degrees and I was working in a really great company. And I just remembered that I wasn't who I was. Like I, I was doing and being what my mom wanted me to be, but it wasn't what I wanted. You know, I was really aware that I was living she was living through me at that point mm. and I shifted. And that's why I think I, I know, I don't think I know I was being very rebellious when I decided to choose David as my partner <laughs> in my mid, <laughs> seriously, in my mid twenties. But anyways, um, you know, I like in terms of, yes, my, uh, like growing up as the eldest daughter, right. And to a young mother and to a busy father, hardworking father, a lot of things, um, made me who I am in terms of I'm really good at operations. I'm really good at, you know, um, taking the lead. But at this junction in my life, I know that self-love um, requires me to, number one, be truthful with myself and what my wants and needs are. And number two is to create boundaries. That's the biggest mm -hmm. thing I learned in the last okay. two months of getting diagnosed is realizing that I needed some really strong boundaries with people in my life that were just not very healthy for me. Yeah. And then um, a really big one right now that I'm learning is how to receive love, like be mm. receiving because, <laughs> and that's what we are as women. Like we're like literally receiving and we don't, you know, because my mom was in a, you know, she always said, Maria, be independent. Don't ever depend on a man. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. uh, be your own per Like she did all, she really hammered that in my head and I kind of became that. And as I was yelling at my son, like the other day, cause I was angry <laughs> at him. Right. And I was just thinking, how am I supposed to get less masculine when I'm so masculine right now, yelling at these kids trying to raise it because I'm a single mom, you yeah. know, and of course yeah. their dad's around, but he's not around all the time. Yeah. And so anyways, I'm learning to, um, to receive as you know, mm -hmm. form of self, because that's something that we don't think about, right? And yeah. then also um, just to create boundaries, because yeah. something that dawned on me as I was meditating was that, um, you know, it's interesting that your immunity, like doesn't detect these cells that got went rogue on you when you have cancer, like how do you, your body's made to heal itself, what happened? And I always believe that everything um, gets manifested physically, from an emotion, from some spiritual place. Okay. And it's interesting how like I, after the diagnosis, I realized, wow, these people are not very good people. Like how did that go under my radar? Like how did my instincts not flare up when I was around these people who were always who they were, but I just didn't see yeah. it. So it was really interesting to that reflect on that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I can... 
I can I can see that. That's that's very interesting. I have so many questions for you about that, but like let's talk about um your your cancer situation because here you are, super healthy, young, fit mom. Um what was your reaction when you got cancer? Were you in denial? Was it you know, do, are you still in denial? How do you tell us about the journey of, of receiving that diagnosis? Well, do you think I'm in denial? <laughs> no, I don't think you're in denial anymore. I'm really proud of you, how you showed up. I can tell that this has changed you. Even though I don't know you, like some other people know you for years, uh -huh. I can tell it's changed you. Uh, the way you're setting boundaries, you mentioned like setting boundaries, like yeah. from what you've told me it's changed you. And I can only imagine that like, that's what it's there for is to, to change you and help you grow, uh, you know, life happening for you instead of to you kind of thing. So maybe talk about, yeah. But you were there, but you were there when I got cancer and I texted you. Yeah. Did I seem like I was in denial? Well, I'm, <laughs> I already kind of know the answer, but I was asking because the audience doesn't know. So I kind of like, yeah, I, I would say, yeah, a little bit. You were in denial a little bit of like, no, this can't be. Or like, you know, but because I here's the thing. I would have reacted the same way. Like, there's no way I have cancer. Like, there's just no way. Like, mm -hmm. I just, I do all the things. Like, we yeah, do yeah. all the things. How is this possible? Yeah, I think a lot of people. Let's talk about that. I think a lot of people felt that way for sure. Yeah. Like when I announced it, I mean, people were, it was huge. I mean, my website was like a lot, there were just a lot of people on it. Really? Like, and I've got a lot of DMS and it was just people calling me and texting me. It was interesting. Is it all positive or was it? Oh, it's always oh, positive, okay, cool. you know, until it gets not so positive. <laughs> we'll talk about that, but, um, you know, so yeah. So, I mean, how did I, I, knew there was something wrong for a long time. I knew for at least a year and a half that something was shifted in my my body. And I was seeing a doctor for it, um, first a Western doctor, and then I had issues with my, with my insurance. And then I had to start seeing a holistic doctor primarily until I broke my arm and went back to my, you know. So anyways, everything happens for a reason. But um, honestly, it felt like at least I had an answer because I, for the longest time, I changed everything. I started drinking celery juice. I, I took sea moss. I changed my diet, went gluten free. There's so many things I just didn't understand. I thought I had like IBS, you know, and, and I and I say this to all the women and men out there, um, especially colon cancer is one of those cancers that's really kind of get it at the late stage because we deal with so much bloating, constipation, so much crap because of the food that we eat and we just don't know how our body reacts. But like, I, I thought I had hemorrhoids because I, that's a, you know, that's my issue yep. since I had babies. Right. And that's what the doctor said until, um, until we checked my blood work, my iron was really, really low. And he was wondering how I was even like functioning. And then, um, we got a CT scan and we saw that there was a mass. And then after, uh, after that, I went and got a colonoscopy and they, you know, they did a biopsy. And I believe that when they punctured the tumor to yeah. do the biopsy, I think that's when the infection happened, which brought me to the ER. And I just had like five days. That's when I found out I had cancer. It was a pretty traumatic, you know, period in my life. And naturally, the it's shocking. But at the same time, you know, it, it's not like it's not curable. But at the same time, it's like, what path do you want to go through to cure this? You know, yeah. like there's a lot of questions. I mean, cancer is what it is. It, it's not, it's not anything you ever want, but one out of two yeah. women out there will have cancer. So it's, it's, wow. it, the question, you know, I didn't go into why me? Cause to me, it's like, well, why not me? Like I can, I can, I'm going to figure this out. Like I'm going to die yeah. trying to figure this out, you know, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> yeah. No, I can, I can see that. And I can tell that I know you have like that, that, that heart of like, you know, you can push through and you can do this. So where's your heart at now today with everything, the cancer and like, are you more accepting of it? Are you like uh, freaking out still? Or are you positive or where is your energy at today? Like, where's your, where, where do you feel like, what do you feel today? So with the cancer, um, I was never freaking out. There was a time when I was sad because yeah. it's interesting. It's kind of like you, like when you're little and like you, you fall, right. And your mother reacts, right. Yeah. 
more people are, it's like reacting to the cancer in such a like scared, fearful way. I mean, it's, it's funny, not funny. It's not funny at all, but it's just, yeah. it's interesting to just see, feel the energy of everybody around you and just mm. also just knowing your own. Right. Yeah. And so for me, I'm not, I know I, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not scared. Like in sense, in the sense of, I know that this existence is temporary and I've known, like I was scared of death my whole life, which is why I was so spiritual. And in my twenties, I had a very spiritual awakening and I knew that, um, that this, you know, you're just going to transition. And so I'm going to live each day in my truth. And so, um, I come, everything I do again is, am I making this decision out of fear or love? Right. Mm, I think about that, you know, are you, are you, are you choosing to go this direction because you're scared of dying or are you choosing to go to the direction because you, you want to live, you know, like it, it's, it's really interesting. And again, there's no right answer. Right. Yeah. So, um, but you have to really get in tune with yourself. So, you know, with me, I, I just know that I've lived my life. I've had such a good life, you know, when I, when I have such great mm-hmm. sons and you know, if, we just don't know when someone has a cancer diagnosis, they know there's limited time. Um, but people in general, like you can, people have, people would might die like driving somewhere, you know, or just having an aneurysm. You just never know. So we just have to just like cancer or anything should not teach you like how to die, but so much how to live, like just Mm. live life to the fullest every single day. Make sure everyone, you know, knows that you love them. And just know that like every single day you wake up, it's a gift. It's a gift. Yeah. yeah it, it shifts your mindset. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. And so that, okay. That, that answers my question about like, what have you learned from cancer? Cause I feel like that's kind of like the lesson that is teaching you. What about, tell, tell, <laughs> tell everyone about you breaking your arm, which just happened a couple months ago how why did that happen (laughs) like and what did you learn from that because that was kind of random like it's like come on universe or god like what why (laughs) why throw this in there too like you know i'm gonna get diagnosed with cancer (laughs) why the broken arm did i tell you what i think about it um no you can tell me what you think about it okay so i broke my arm in september found out i had cancer in november right but keep in mind remember let's like go back all the way back in september you broke your arm think so remember because i said yeah because i said i was going to get it off by end of october so i know that i know it happened mid-september so anyways so i i was roller skating and like all of a sudden i literally i always say this story i felt like i was spiritually pushed because there's nothing around me and i'm a really good skater and i went down and you know obviously i try to break it break my fall but i ended up breaking my arm and dislocating the other bone right and um and I was in so good spirit. When you say spiritually push, you mean like some something pushed you. Yeah, something okay. pushed me. In fact, I don't share this video publicly, but anyways, if anyone understands orbs, somebody, one of my girlfriends stopped the frame and saw like three orbs around my head. And I thought oh, that was very yeah. interesting. Yes. So anyways, remember yeah, I said I had I had it. health insurance issues, right? Yes. And um, I finally like, it's a, it's a long story, but it's not that it's their fault. And I could probably do some damage at Kaiser. But anyways, yeah. I ended up um, going to the hospital and settling my health insurance issues. I ended up having to pay a lump sum of, of a lot of stuff because of something on their end. But anyways, um, if I didn't go, as soon as I fell, the first thing I thought was, now I can go get my stomach checked. That was my first thought. It wasn't, oh. let me... It wasn't, um, oh, shoot, I broke my arm because I knew I broke my arm. I could see it. Um, it. The first thought was, at least I can go get my stomach checked now. And so um, so I think that I broke my arm to get my health insurance like in check. And then I um, and then I found out I had cancer. So I think that's the reason. Yeah. And that's a lot to take on at once. And like. I know you personally, so I know you've had some sad moments, oh, yeah. you know, where you've let yourself cry. You've let yourself cry. You've let yourself feel the pain of it all. Because I think that's kind of what my perception of you out like, before I got to know you was like, oh, you just are like positive vibes only, like no negative vibes. You never feel the negative feelings. But I think this has kind of forced you to slow down, right? 
and feel your feelings and feel the suck of it. And sometimes life sucks, but it's not, you're not going to stay stuck there. I can tell you, knowing you, you're not going to stay stuck there. Um, but it's, it's really powerful to see. I mean, I don't wish what you've been through on anybody because you've been through like so much in such a short period of time and you're handling it really, really well as a single mom. And my heart goes out to you because I understand what you were saying before about being the mom and the dad in, in the, in the, as a single parent. And that's so hard. Cause you're like, okay, I'm in my masculine a lot. How do I get out of this? How do I find that balance? And it's hard when you're doing everything by yourself. Um, and so I, I hear you and I, I, I want your, I wanted to share your story because I'm sure there are people out there who are going through really hard things as well. And, um, you, I think can give them a lot of hope, um, because you're living it and you're able to push through, um, which is remarkable. Um, so you broke your arm in September, diagnosed in October, diagnosed in November, Iowa, mm -hmm. diagnosed in November. Sorry. So you broke your arm in September, diagnosed in November. Ayahuasca mm -hmm. in November. <laughs> you still went to like Costa Rica, right? <laughs> what did you experience? What what came up for you? What was your intention or expectations going so, into ayahuasca? Yeah, as you know, well, as you and know, ayahuasca is a really big plant medicine, right? Um, and I, yep. I, it's been calling for me, but I really went because my my friend Dave. I have really good um, friends in my life, especially Dave is one of my dearest ones. And he wanted to do ayahuasca and he said he wouldn't do it unless I went with him. And so me being the supportive friend, I'm like, okay, I'll go with you. And so we had set this trip up like, you know, months prior. And then, um, I get diagnosed, you know, November 10th, I think, or 11th. And, um, and I'm supposed to leave after Thanksgiving to go to this retreat. <laughs> And I remember yep. you were surprised that I was still going and I, I think everyone was yeah, because was obviously like, it's a yeah. stressful time. Right. But I felt like, well, how, yep. how ideal and non-coincidental is the fact that I had this trip planned um, prior to like, the, the, like it wasn't, it was just this trip was planned and I just got diagnosed. Right. And I think that we have to get to the root of the cause. Right. That's the issue I have with just modern conventional Western medicine is just like really like figuring out like treating the symptom, not the root. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I went to ayahuasca and I really kind of understood more deeply where the cancer came from, you know, where it was rooted from. And, um, and it was really transformational and I would really recommend everybody to just, you know, whether it be breath work, you know, ayahuasca, yeah or other forms of um, other forms of psychedelics. I, as long as it's in a safe environment, I think it's great. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. I, I remember you telling me about your experience and it was, it, would you say it was an easy experience? Would you say it was a hard experience, a beautiful experience? I would. What was the experience like? So um, it was, it's hard. It's the hardest thing you're ever going to do. I don't know if you remember how hard it was. Okay. I do. <laughs> Cause you I purge do. a lot yeah. and you, you think it's, all, I mean, it's not, purging is not the worst thing. It actually feels amazing when you do. Um, but you really go deep in your consciousness of what is, um, yeah. what you need to learn about yourself. And, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's not just what you have to learn. It's like something that maybe your mother or your grandmother, because you guys all have the same cells, yeah. like it's all inside of you. And so yeah. when I went through my experience, it was very, um, I felt so much. Um, but in the end, I was really empowered. Like I, I understood more deeply who I was and, um, and uh, I really enjoyed the experience. And most people who did it, did <laughs> yeah yeah no i i hear you and, and then also you, you threw on an expo mm -hmm. in january and that's where we met each other yes. for the first time um and it i i didn't think you were gonna do that either i'm like why are you trying to do an expo <laughs> like and try and like you're doing so much already but i think it's kind of like it's, it helps you probably get through because if you just sit yeah. in your pain it, it's kind of a lot to handle and this is kind of like what you do with work, like kind of not a distraction, but just kind of like, I, I want to live my purpose, which leads me to my last question for you. You said you looked at your mom and she was dying and you saw a woman who didn't really fully live the life she wanted. 
if you look at yourself in the mirror, are you living the life that you want to live? Or is your son going to look at you when you pass away and be like, she didn't live the life she mm -hmm. wanted to? That is a very good question. And um, through my ayahuasca journey, through my daily meditations, the answer is, is that um, I, I knew that I was in denial for a lot of my marriage. And I know that I'm in denial on a lot of the few friendships I had because I just kind of refused to see past the rose colored glasses. And I realized that, and we don't, a lot of people who do this, we don't talk about it, but looking at the bright side is not always healthy for you, obviously, right? Um, and yeah. like learning those boundaries and all that. Um, I will say that um, I understood my rebellious side and I saw this thing on Instagram and it, but there's a wave and it said, maybe it doesn't have to be so hard. And I was just mm. like, whoa, Ooh. because like my <laughs> whole life has been so hard, you know? Um, and yeah. so I felt like I had to like, I'm a scrappy, you know, work hard, like, you know, no sleep, yeah. like no excuses. Right. <laughs> and um, everything in my life, I worked hella hard for. And, and I just realized, maybe it doesn't have to be that way. And so maybe mm. marriage isn't loving someone isn't supposed to be as hard as it was in my first marriage. Right. And even when I did yeah. the expo, it was super easy. Like I was like, when I told you I was still going to do it, it was like early December. I only had like a handful yeah. of vendors. I had not really done much with the website and, um, but I did it and it was fun and it was successful. And it just goes back to maybe work doesn't have to be so hard, you know, and life yeah. doesn't have to be even healing. Does healing have to be so hard? Cause sometimes mm. healing is just about resting and just like rediscovering yeah. yourself. And as you rediscover yourself, discovery in general is exciting, you know? And, um, so maybe it's not that bad when you find pieces of your shadow, you know, and you <laughs> overcome things, you see the light. So, yeah, I think that my sons will definitely know that um, I live my life on my terms, you know? Yeah, I think yeah. they see it all the time. And I do it with a lot of love and compassion and forgiveness. I mean, I, I love it. I know they love it when they see me love their dad, you know, and vice versa. Mm. Because that means that they can love themselves. And I, I think mm. that's something that um, a lot of parents need to really remember is that loving your, the other the father or the mother, you know, it, it really allows the children to love themselves because when you, when they watch you forgive others or they watch you forgive yourself and you just roll with it because nobody's perfect, they can be like, I can roll with yeah. it too, you know, like there's been struggles and I yeah. can do this. And, you know, I just think that my kids are going to be fine. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, since we're coming up on time here, I kind of want to ask you, like, it seems like a lot of this stuff that we've been talking about has happened in 2023. Here we are in 2024. Where do you see 2020? What do you see 2024 for you, mm -hmm. Maria? Like where, where do you hope to go? What, what do you plan on doing this year? you know, after all you've, all the lessons that you're, you've learned, you are learning. What do you hope for this year of 2024 for you? Well, I mean, obviously I'd like to heal from cancer this year. Um, but you know, I had a great meditation and it was like, mm -hmm. and it was, and I was listening to myself talk, right. Cause you can hear yourself, you're, you know, like, Oh, I need to do this today or that today. And one of my, I, I was listening to myself. And I'm like, I ask a lot of questions because you know I do. I'm very inquisitive. I ask questions. Yeah. I was like, where do you ask a lot of questions? And I'm saying this in my head. And I thought, I'm going to ask myself a question, which is, what do you <laughs> love? What brings you joy? And I, I know what brings me joy. Like, usually it's dancing. It's like being with friends. It's like reading, writing, creating things, doing projects, being like, you know, busy. Yeah. And I'm productive is a big one. Um. But immediately when I said that, all I heard was doing absolutely nothing. 
And that was so powerful. And it made me Google because that's not the answer I thought I was going to get. But I realized that um, one of my defenses growing up was not only seeing the bright side of things constantly, but also being distracted. Like, let me move this energy. Let me distract myself. But what do I truly love to do? You know, like truly. Even like when I wake up, I have nothing to do. Like, think about that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I love that, especially for you, because I feel like a similar thing, like slow down, just be still. And I think our yeah. Western society of like, go, 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 do more, be more, have more is all about like that hustle, the grind, don't sit still. You mm-hmm. know, you can sleep when you die that I love, like, sure, that gets you ahead in certain areas of your life, but it comes at a cost. And I think yeah. there's value in being still. And I think all these things that have happened to you have really helped you to slow down and just be still. And I think it's, you know, beautiful what you've done. Cause I know some on a more personal level, some of the changes you made in your business and your life to really like accommodate slowing down and being still. It doesn't mean you, you don't wake up and kick ass still. You still do more than like <laughs> most people I know, but for you to slow down is it, it, it says a lot. And I'm glad that you're listening. Cause I can definitely, tell that it's it's much needed in your life at this time and you know honestly like it's a lesson for me because like i said i see a lot of myself in you as far as like the way you were raised and that that type of mentality that you have um so i I appreciate that um i really really appreciate you coming on being vulnerable maria and talking about all the things like you talked about a lot of hard things that i know are uncomfortable for a lot of people to talk about but i think your your story is so powerful for other people to listen and hear and, and be inspired from. So thank you. And I'm sorry you're going through what you're going through. And I really hope this is an amazing year for you. Uh, where do you want people to you know, follow you or, or see you on social media or website? Where do you want to send people to? People can always um, go to my website, mariaking.com. I've been blogging since 2005. Wow. It's a long time. Okay, only, almost 20 years. Coming up in oh, 20 years. more than 20, I think. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Yeah, 2005 is <laughs> 2024. You know, I can't do <laughs> math. Anyways, so, <laughs> <All 20. laughs> so anyways, we can, people can find me there and meet me when I was in my mid-20s and single and like watch my journey. <laughs> um, I can also, I, you can also find me on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Maria King yeah. Fitness. Awesome. Thank you again, Maria. I really appreciate it. Maybe we'll do a follow-up when you beat cancer right? Not if yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll put it out there. Uh, you're awesome. Really appreciate you coming on Maria and uh, we'll talk again very soon. Okay. Okay. Have a good one. Go!